Welcome to Pastors Podcast Season Two. Season Two. Here I it feel is. like there should be like streamers and those, know. you know, you know, when people come so, in. We oh. are back. We are back for another round. Uh, I'd say that we got picked up for season two. We picked ourselves up. The problem is, is we're the ones making these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have been picked up for season two of the Pastors feels good. Podcast. The first one was feels so good. good. It feels great. We're back for season two. I feel like we need two. some champagne or, I mean, it could be, you know, sparkling cider, but just some, just a pop, you know, pop some uh, some lids. Something. We're excited. We're excited <laughs> so, to jump in. This is a podcast for pastors church leaders, teams, really, if you are in the trenches, invested in building the local church, then this is a podcast for you. I am Banning Liebscher, pastor of Jesus Culture, and joined by some really great friends who are also pastors and pastors of church, well, you've even longer, senior pastors senior longer pastors. than me, is that wow. correct? Uh, we planted right around the same time. Right around the same time. time. Like so, so I'm joined by, again, Bane Leapshire, pastor of Jesus Culture, joined by... Phil Manginelli. I am the lead pastor of The Square, northwest side of Atlanta, specifically Smyrna, Georgia. And uh, just honestly want to just say, personally, season one was like, really uh, marked me. I, I'm actually... A really That's right. proud of the conversations we were able to have. Yes. I can't wait for the conversations we're gonna have in season two, and it's a just a, honestly feels like a great pr privilege to be a part of this. Yeah, I'm Nate Edwardson, pastor of the Stirring Church in Redding, California, the other church in Redding, California, and uh, and I just love doing this with friends. Uh, I just think right now we need each other. We need friends yeah. more than ever, and that's that's part of. Part of this journey is authentic friendships as we run together as pastors. A lot's happened since season one. I think uh, this is the weird <laughs> part of the day that we live in. It, there's a lot that's happened yep. since season one. Yep. Um, and and I'm sure that we'll be talking about all that's happened. But we, I just want to, can we just stop for a second and just say, well done. Well done. Well done. Everybody that's listening right now. Maybe you don't need to hear this from me. Maybe you don't know me personally, but I'm just, I am around pastors, people building the local wow. church. I, I am so impressed. It's been a difficult season, yeah. a lot to navigate. You guys are in this spot. People are asking me, and, and we thought kind of maybe the season was going to be over and then it kind of keeps going, you know, and it's obviously, oh, we're in a ex really extended season of this. I remember John Tyson, who is a guest on season two. <laughs> You were like, he said it's going to last four months. I was like, this is not going to last four months. <laughs> That's right. He's a pessimist. He's at least, It's going to last two weeks. Uh, he was wrong. <laughs> we, he was we're being, all pretty wrong. He was being optimistic. But, but just all of the complexities that come yeah. with this, every day you're making a decision that feels like it's got 10 different possible outcomes and yep. layers and somebody's not happy somewhere and all that type of stuff. And you know what? You're still here. Well That's done. Right. Jesus Go buy yourself some Krispy Kreme. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, listen, this is how Jesus I Jesus is you, building people, this church. I, had somebody, I said someone was like, Hey, how how have you done you know, you know, pastoring through COVID? And I was like, Well, I've done a few more Krispy Kreme ones <laughs> than I planned. It's it's, it's so true. Yeah. But the Lord I, is good. I, I am I am authentically proud of pastors yeah. Yeah. who have who have led um through this season. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. It's, it's been, true. It's been so challenging. It's been a difficult season, but also I, I will say this, not just to be positive, all, but like the faithfulness of God in this season yeah. has been profound. Yeah, like I, just on. encountering the faithfulness of God, encountering God building his church. And I think many people are maybe tired or some are not. Some are like just <laughs> soaring, you know, it's amazing. But but some are tired and all that. But in, in the midst of all of it, I just, I have, you just have that sense. This is yeah. unto something. Yeah. Like God yeah, is on. up to something yeah. in our midst and I just want to have a front row seat to whatever That's God it. is doing. And so you're still here. Well done. Thanks for jumping on season two podcast. Uh, listen, if you haven't gone back and listened to season one, I would encourage you to really, really yep. great conversations in season one. And uh, that, that will hopefully be helpful. Our, our goal with this is to come alongside you and challenge you, encourage you, equip you, inspire you, all yep. of the above. We actually, we actually are um, doing this intro the last day so we've had a bunch of these conversations yep. already. So I think we can kind of give you even a preview of 
uh, these conversations in season two ha- have been marking yeah. and profound. Yeah. And I, every single one, I, I'm in the mode, I'm sure you guys are too, where I'm just taking notes and I'm like, I, I legitimately don't care if anybody else listens to this. No, <laughs> if I put these, <laughs> if I put all of these recording days to sit down with these eight different guests or nine different guests, however many it was, I'm like, this is... This is really I like I'm going to go I'm encouraged and I'm challenged That's and I'm right. going to go implement some stuff and change some stuff and like it was it No, was, I'm going home with some like word of the Lord to me yeah. through this that uh that I I I can't deny. I mean it was it, it's it's been really significant. Yeah. Yeah, I've filled up half of a moleskin journal <laughs> totally. already. <laughs> and, but it but it's moved me. These conversations have moved me. This this is this is a podcast like we're a part of hosting it, but this is for us. Yeah. And uh you know, I'm I'm genuinely um expectant for what God is going to do through this season. And I think our heart for the pastor's podcast is really to come alongside pastors, that they would be encouraged, equipped, all that stuff. And in that vein, one of the things that we're going to be doing that we're all excited about is, you know, this is part of the Jesus Culture Podcast Network, this pastor's podcast, and Jesus Culture is going to be putting on our first ever pastor's conference. Yeah. We've been running come together. On. This is our heart, right? Even the podcast, yeah. it all flows together. Our hearts to come alongside pastors, their teams, church leaders, and uh, so we're doing our first ever pastor's conference with the heart of just to say, hey, let's gather, let's seek God. We want to see revival in our That's day. Right. And I think people, I think pastors, I think, Phil, you're walking with a lot of pastors and their teams, and they, they are looking for something. No, it's, and, and I think what what's in our heart is we just recognize this has been a really unique season, and it's clarified what you need. And what you need as a pastor in the season is resourcing around uh, the real things we're facing, uh, voices that you can trust, and and being in uh, the environment of the kind of people that you want to cultivate in your life. And I just think that that for us, when we begin to dream about this conference, what we ask the question is, is what is actually something we would go to ourselves? Right. We've gone to conferences, we've spoke at conferences, we've been a part of conferences, and they're great. That I, but, but we all know that there are things that are at the ache of our heart. And what we realize is there needs to be a place at the table for pastors to come and get what they need. And that's the desire of our heart is how do we do that? And so I want to encourage you. I think more than any other season, we as pastors and as pastoral leaders and pastoral teams, we need the right things. And uh, I think this might be one of those moments where we can get around the right conversations oh, and vision and leaders and people and voices yep. that give that to us. Yep, revival in our day. It's gonna be prophetic. It's gonna be practical. Uh, we have a heart just to kind of run with people. And so we've got some of our favorite people, Alex Seeley, who was uh, a guest on the first season, Corey Russell, who will be a guest on this season, wow. myself. We've got, you guys are doing breakouts. We've got a ton of different breakouts. You can get all the information. It's gonna be happening in January here in the Sacramento area at our new building in Folsom, California in January. We'd love to have you come out and be a part of it and just kind of check it out. And we're really focusing on six things. So so even the podcast, the, the conference, all these things are kind of beginning to be wrapped up on kind of six focuses that we have. The first one being first love lifestyle, soul intentionality, theological clarity, leadership formation, communication excellence, and cultural engagement. Those six things we want to say, hey, we're going to go after those six right. things. We're going to focus on those six Can I things. just say I'm so impressed that you nailed all six of those things. <laughs> I was like, oh, can he do it? I'm really impressed, honestly. Good job. But that's, that's awesome. it. And, and the, I, think, I think this is a season again where, where it is time to gather around what we actually need. Yeah. And that, yeah, come on. More those than anything, six areas, I would die yeah. on the hill of those six yeah, things. Absolutely. We yeah, absolutely. We need them, and we also need the kind of people who want them. Yeah. So I'm just saying, come and yeah. get around the right environment and watch what God yep. will do. In All right, Let's season go. two, Pastors Podcast. Here it's we go. getting started. Uh, listen to all of the conversations. They are really good. But the first one is from a friend of ours, Corey Russell. Russell, who every time he speaks, honestly, stirs my heart, wow. makes me want to go love Jesus yeah, more. Yeah, get ready to repent. Yeah, get ready to repent. Just so with the Corey Russell episode, have a have a piece of paper where you're taking notes yes. and have a piece of paper where you're just writing repentance. Yes, tell it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so, so our first conversation of season two is with Corey Russell. I know it's going to impact your life. Let's do this. Corey, it's so great to have you with us. I sure appreciate you jumping on and taking some time. 
It's an honor to be with you, Banning. Love you, man. Look, listen, we'd like to get this out of the way right off the bat because um, John Tyson, who it will be a guest on the podcast, a, a great friend of ours, has stated this publicly. Is it public that he's stated public. this? He's stated this publicly. Painfully public. That you are his favorite preacher of all time. And uh, or not of all time, of current times. I don't even know what context it was, but you're his favorite preacher. And the problem that Phil and I have is we both have preached at his church. Yes. We both have been (laughs) there, and yet somehow... I, I don't know. I'm not in the top three, I, mean, I can tell you that. Well, I've preached there a couple of times, and I haven't. Even, it's not even like Phil's a good preacher. It's not, you know, it's not even that that I'm not his favorite preacher of all time, which is now a, just a goal that I want to get to. Goal. I want to dethrone Corey. Oh, we are dethroning but I, Corey. But I would just take, hey, Phil, that was a good job. Hey, Phil, you were, you were almost as good as Corey. <laughs> you, you was a decent day. Decent job. John doesn't, John doesn't encourage you like that. He's no. hardcore. He's back to the whole time. You didn't quote enough thinkers. That's the problem. You didn't quote enough source he, material. Yep. Yeah. He only compliments you if you're at like 20 <laughs> source material quotes or you're just Love functioning it. in the power of the spirit. That's and so it without it, well, one of those two, and I'm just in a strange middle ground that doesn't really hit yeah, either that's territory. You know? Well, anyways, great to have you with us. Corey, can you give us a real quick history of who you are? Uh, uh, many people wouldn't know who you are. Many wouldn't. Can you just give a context of what you've been doing the last 20 years of ministry and then what you're currently doing? Uh, absolutely. First off, I don't know if I believe John. I imagine there's a lot better <laughs> preachers out there. Um, you know, I, I, I spent, uh, I'm originally from Northwest Arkansas, got radically saved in 1997, got hit by the power of God, and then the Lord got married to my wife in 98, had our first daughter in 99, and then we moved to Kansas City to join the International House of Prayer, where we spent 18 years uh, running uh, with the crew there and 30 plus hours a week of prayer, fasting, Bible, crying out in revival. And uh, Lord really began just to release messages, books, and prayer albums and things out of that. And um, and then about three years ago, coming on three years, uh, January of 2019, we were actually on a sabbatical in 2016, and the Lord spoke transition. Well, it ended up coming about in January of 2019, where we moved to Dallas, Texas, and joined the Upper Room uh, Church family here. And been on the team, been on the staff here, just building uh, the prayer culture and teaching and training and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's awesome. Been married to my wife, Dana, 23 years, got a 21-year-old daughter, 18-year-old daughter, and 11-year-old daughter. And uh, just love it. Mench- he mentioned Upper Room, which you get, we know Michael Miller right. and, and really a phenomenal place. Uh, really what they're doing out there in Dallas is incredible. But I was just out there having lunch with these guys. I flew in and I went to meet him at their place. And uh, I thought it was their school. I don't know how many was there. A couple hundred people in the room, maybe 150 or so. So I go into their sanctuary. I'm waiting for him. And so I just pop in. I'm like, oh, man, this is awesome. Their school's in session. And there's like a prophetic dance happening. And there's people on stage and people sprawled out everywhere. And then they start taking communion. So I just take communion with them. And I'm walked out. And I'm like, dude, I was just in there with your school. They're like, school? That's not our school. That's our noon prayer set. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is happening wow. every day. I know, you know, one of those things you're like, wow, I was, that's incredible. It's beautiful. Like it was, I, I, you guys are doing prayer sets how many times a week? We go morning, noon, and night, Monday to Friday, and then a Saturday morning. But it wasn't like just a couple people in the prayer room, it right. was packed in the prayer room. Wow. And uh, it was, it was, it actually kind of marked me. I was there. I'm like, okay, it, it gave me some fresh vision. So, Corey, here's what we'd like to talk about. You're talking to pastors right now, church leaders. We obviously are all in the trenches, been in the trenches for a long time. What I would love to talk with you about and maybe talk to the pastors about that are listening is how the house of prayer and the local church, how does this all integrate? You were 18 years in a house of prayer. For those who don't know, IHOP, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. I mean, you're going. You, you, they've been going 24-7 since 1999. 24 seven in prayer and worship and uh, wow. a really profound place, really incredible what's happening there. Yeah. But I found as a local pastor, it's, it, it didn't always seem to, it, it raised the water level of prayer. I could feel that, but then it seemed to be not at odds because that's not the right word. And I want you to unpack this a little bit. And are you doing prayer at your church at all, Nate? Yeah. On, 
Yeah, we are, but I'm I'm absolutely just kind of embarrassed right now. We pray <laughs> once a week. Totally. We pray. It's like noonday prayer on Wednesdays. So my house shall be called a house of prayer I, once a week I, for listen, an hour. Listen, I'm going back. I'm changing everything. <laughs> yeah, totally. we, we will we will we will have the the upper room no, model so totally. from now on. It's, it's and, and I know you've got stuff going on, Phil. Yeah, we actually and part of the vision is getting to where upper room is. Yes, and we're we're building. We're at four sets now, but uh, the the dream would be that morning, yeah. afternoon, evening. Evening, uh, prayer room. So I think we all have a heart. I, I would be doing more prayer if we had a building. Can I just blame it that I don't have a building? Is that possible? Because <laughs> yes. I'm sure all these underground churches in the world, that's their excuse as it's well. True. They don't have a building. As long as you can look at the underground church of China and, <laughs> and tell them you're not praying yes. because of a okay. lack of building, I think that's a fine. Let's Absolutely. move on to that. We're going <laughs> to talk to Corey. Corey, but I have found a little bit that much of the house of prayer culture, which I have a high value for and love and has stirred my heart, at some level doesn't know what to do with the local church. Right. And at some level is a little bit annoyed by the local church, by the lack of zeal, by the lack of prayer, by the lack of whatever. You've actually been 18 years in the house of prayer, and now you are in a local church context. Obviously, Upper Room has an apostolic national call on it. But you're in the local church concept. Can you kind of unpack a little bit of that? Because we have a heart to see the church praying. Yeah. We yeah. want to talk to, We want to talk to pastors about pra- pastors praying. But we're talking about that the church would actually be a house of prayer. And so many, I feel, are maybe kind of don't quite don't quite know what to do with that. But also, the house of prayer concept seems to like somehow not quite mesh. Can you? Is this even? I ask very general questions, but can you unpack that a little bit for us? Absolutely. Well, I just want to I just want to start with the answer of how much love and respect I have for pastors and leaders, ones that are bearing the load. And what you guys, you guys are heroes of mine and uh, heroes in the earth and everything that you bear week in and week out. It's historic. And I have great love and respect for you and great love and respect for what pastors across the earth are doing. You know, I, um, you know, one of the, one of the, the early phrases that uh, the Lord spoke in the early days to, to Mike through a prophet was that God was going to raise up prayer in the spirit of the tabernacle of David. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that I think marked King David is David had this overarching zeal from his early days to put ministry to God and prayer, worship and prayer and ministry to God at the center of the, of the nation, the center of the city. And, and he put singers and he put musicians around the glory. You know, David did something historic in his day. He removed the veils and he put singers and musicians around it. And he says, I've learned the blueprint. God is enthroned in the praises of his people. God's throne will descend and we will, we will have God fight our battles for us. We will see divine resource, divine wisdom. David would go into the prayer room and have visions. You know, David's not just a hippie with a guitar. He, he was a prophet is what Peter called him. And uh, I, I think, I think, he saw many things. And I think there's divine strategies that David caught and in insight and in the prophetic spirit. I really believe within my heart that, that the Lord is remembering David in these days. And he's taking David's vow of, of ministry to God as something to the side with a handful of cold ones. And he's raising up leaders that are going to bring it to the center and, and that are going to begin to prioritize the place of worship, being in the presence hosting the presence, and agreeing with God through intercession. And I just want to say here at the thing, I said in 24-7 for 18 years, it's, it's beautiful, it's glorious. But I want to tell you, as Mike said for years, only do that if God forces you to. I don't really believe that's the model that's going to be sustainable in local church context. I really, I think the morning, noon, and night is brilliant. But you know what? I celebrate noon on Wednesday. I celebrate prioritizing that's you. <laughs> that's you nate that's you that, that's that, true that I once a weeker it. i receive it <laughs> no i celebrate that because i would rather do one well than a hundred just for the sake of whatever it's not about quantity per se it's about priority and being able to say god we, we care about this place of ministering to you and so i believe god's raising up leaders that are going to begin to put it back to the center because i, I don't think we can bear. I think the, 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 the burden is unfair on our leaders and on our pastors and the burnout and the weight and the pressure to where we look to them to solve the thousand things. And I believe God's releasing a model 
uh, and putting prayer back at the center and removing the stigma off of it to take the burden off of the system that's crippling and crushing our leaders. And, and, and that's what I believe, too, is that we begin to connect people to God instead of running to the pastor to fix their problems. We actually begin to teach people how to look at God and how to begin to engage with him for the fight of their marriage and for the breakthrough for their child and for the breakthrough in their business or whatever it may be. So I, I believe this is God's lifeline to the current church structure that's going to begin to release the things that we're longing for. Corey, one of the things that you're saying that is so, um, I think, significant because especially walking through these last couple of years, right? We've always known that there's a, there's a, there's a burden and there's a, a cost to ministry. And, and one of the things about pastoral ministry that's difficult is that we recognize there's an there's a unfair pressure being put our way, but we're also not trying to be uh, uh, self-pitied, right? We're not trying to, like I signed up to lay down my life. I signed up to bear the burden. I want to lift up my church. I want to take, I want to bear the weight, uh, even if at times people don't understand it or, or these things, but, but, but there's this reality that's being formed that I think that you're putting language to wow. is that there is a weight that I cannot actually carry. And wow. my church, both I need to lead them in this and I need them to awaken in this, is that there has to be a burden that gets placed at the feet of Jesus that right now is a burden that's being placed both on the pastorate and on the structure. And so when people come, when the people come at the pastorate or people come at the structure, I think there's fairness to it. But I think there's this is a piece of it is saying, no, I actually think we have lost our ability to depend on the Lord. And as churches, we, in some ways, we've lost our ability to help our people know how to depend on the Lord. And I think this is this is even wow. the vision for me of why I want to bring the prayer room back to that. Like I lo- your language is moving me back to the place of center because in some ways, it's like the, the, to move forward, there has to be a people who learn how to put the weight on the Lord. And if for churches to make Come it, on. for pastors to make it. And this would even be my appeal. And, and Corey, even just listening, my appeal to pastors who are listening to this are like, I don't know, I don't, I, how do I do this? How do I prioritize this? I'm just saying, could you catch a vision of some of the pressure not being on you, of, of creating a way for people to come and put dependency on the Lord that right now they're putting on you in a structure that is just so painful. And I, I just think pastors need that more than the, the last two years have, for me, of course, as we've walked through so much stuff, have, have brought things from, from the background to the forefront that if we aren't creating a place where people know how to come and put the weight on the Lord, we're not gonna make wow. it. I mean, where, I mean, how, I mean, this is, how many conversations have we had with people? I mean, how many yeah. pastors have I talked to that the, the, the conversations in their mind are like, I don't wanna do this anymore. I mean, this is the reality of what the last two years have done is they've crushed God's leaders in, in a way where, where part of it has to be, man, we gotta have a place for people to come to bring the weight somewhere, the weight to the Lord. Even why do you think it's a struggle for pastors to actually establish this priority center culture? I, I mean, you're around churches right now, and and what? Why is it? Do you think that it's actually a struggle? I I don't know. I guess there'd be some pastors that kind of like I don't really have a heart for this, but but pastors have a heart for this stuff, or or maybe they don't. I don't know, but somehow I have a hard time prioritizing this or actually establishing it. What what's your experience with that? What would you say? Um, I, I think, I think most pastors and leaders, you know, in their twenties, they had the long hours with Jesus going after him. This has been in their heart for years. I just think it's the way it's always been. And we get into systems that are just built towards putting that burden on people and things run through them. And we just wake up 10 years later and we find ourselves weighed down by all the pressures and demands. I, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. That be, I, I just know I've been taking students through Moses's journey. I, I walk them through the Bible, Genesis, all the way through, and just struck afresh recently over the burden that kept resting on Moses and over him bearing that thing and how you know his father-in-law said, it's not good that you bear this thing alone. It's got to rest on, on the rest. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it's the way it's always been. It's going to take courage for us to break into this and to prior, it's going to take a breaking because I feel like this is the wine skin that's going to be able to handle what he wants mm-hmm. to release in this next season, but it's going to take courage 
because we don't know to do anything but then what we've seen. I, I want, Nate, I want you to jump in, but this is fascinating to me, the systems part, even as he's That's talking right. right now, because we build systems and then those systems kind of uh, push that culture forward. But if you're not building systems around a culture of prayer, if you're not building systems right. yep. that actually say, no, this system is built to handle the weight of what we're carrying. The you know we build systems of organization of all that type of stuff to handle the weight of things. That's fascinating to me. Like as I look at our systems, are our systems built? Yeah, we've sent we've had a system that has paid the professionals to go pray and or them to yep. seek God. And the thing is shifting off of you go to Moses. That's what I was thinking about with Moses. Moses, you go talk to him. <laughs> you go figure it out and come back and tell us what you hear. And I think God's breaking that. And he goes, no, we're all a kingdom of priests. And that power of that corporate reality that I think he wants to bring us into. Yeah, Corey, I feel like this conversation about prayer as a priority, not just because we should be praying, not just that that we should be, but it's it's actually a healthy paradigm and a healthy culture that allows us as pastors to not burn out yeah. and be crushed under that. I think it's a profound conversation. Um, to me, to me, what's what's intriguing about those those years of David's tabernacle is is that story right before David brings the ark into the city of Jerusalem. And as they bring the ark in, um, you know, the oxen stumble, the, the cart, the new cart falls. Utzah, his friend puts his hand on it. Utzah, his name means strength. Those things we do in our own strength as leaders and he's struck dead in a moment. It's fascinating, um, the three months where David steps back and he's upset and he's angry because all he wants, he has the right desire, but he, but, there, but he doesn't know the way. And after three months, the word of the Lord comes, the way, the, the sustainable, the healthy, the way to carry the ark, the way to see the presence of God come into the city. And it's as if, when I hear you talking, it's as if the old paradigm, like the, the, the old paradigms are crumbling yes. and they're crashing. The oxen are stumbling, the cart's falling, and we've got to figure out a way to actually do, do prayer in a way that doesn't crush us. Yeah. Nate, yeah. I, I just want to say, I, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. The question David asked is, how can I bring the ark to me? Is the literal question he asked. Yeah. And I think there's tailor-made ways. See, that's why I'm grateful for all the different ministries and different things like that. I believe God wants to release tailor-made ways to every pastor and every leader and every context. And as soon as we try to make this group, the next model, will do the same thing there. And it may not be the way for our people and our culture and our city and its way. I think it's about David taking the three months to inquire of the Lord. And you find it goes from the new cart. And now this is, the, now I'm going to hit the core issue. It's because of our metrics of success. This is going to begin to deal with our metrics of success, of impact. And it's going to begin to confront a lot of those metrics that I think have been faulty is David, it goes from the new cart that's moving fast into on the back of the priest, every six paces, sacrificing again, which means slow, yeah. not as, you know, exciting. And it's going to require wow. a different movement and a different revelation to hit the people of God of the power of the mundane, slow connection with God and prioritizing his presence. And and I, I think there's stuff in that at, regarding, but that that's key. Can you can you unpack that a little bit more? Because as pastors, you know, there's so many pastors, me included, that like change, that like variety, that don't want to do the same thing all the time. That you know, we're just those video announcements. We need to change them. They're boring now. You know, whatever. Even simple things. You know, some guys, Bill, you know, Bill Johnson, my, my pastor up in Reading. I mean, that guy can do the same thing every day for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah. There's an offering reading that we do, we did at Bethel. They've been doing it for 25 years and it's the same offering reading on Sunday. And I'm just like, for me, I'm like, let's do something That's right. new. So, so That's right. some guys can do the same thing every time, but a lot of pastors you're talking to, the reason why they're leaders or whatever else is because they're, they're, they're creative and they want change and they want all that type yeah, of stuff. Yeah, like what else can we do other than communion? Yes, totally. Like, can we change <laughs> this? Can, totally. we, is there, <laughs> look, can we make a video around it? Can we, yeah, no, you're, but there's even like, how do I spice up communion? That's right. <laughs> but they, so can you talk about this real quick? Because I think this is important. 
Much of prayer is what you're talking about. Can you thrive and value the mundane and slow? How, how, how important is it if you're really going to actually have a value for this or establish this to be able to walk out the mundane and the slow and maybe the boring? Am I allowed to say boring? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think we need, I think we need a transition in because we want to make impact. What we're doing, part of it's our gift mix and what we're looking for, God, what's going to bring the long-term impact, take us where we need to get. And I think there's an element to where we need a new breed of leaders that are going to bear that and are going to lead that because it can't be delegated to the few women off in a back room or to the intercessory team. That's another thing, too, is that David led the whole context. David led the, the parade in. There is an element of the mundaneness. There's an element of the boring. There's a lot of that because it's so different than what we've known. I think we can find our innovative ways and our ways to scratch those itches in other places. And I think actually it'll fuel the innovation, but it'll come out of the slow and mundane way of what happens when you get the God ordained visions to do this, this, and this, and uh, versus just being busy. So I, I think I think we're going to see a new breed of lead. I think we've got to buy in to the slow, mundane process of ministry to God and go on the journey of finding out how really unlovely God really is to us and going on that journey and acquainting people with God. You, you guys might, uh, it's interesting, he talks about the early 20s, you know, and just just getting up early, going and praying and but it, it was like in my early 20s, I wasn't as emotionally tired. Mm-hmm. So what begins to happen, honestly, I have like one little baby at home. Uh, I'm youth pastoring, which at the time I thought was complicated. But, you know, I'm like playing ping pong and planning retreats and going out to eat with kids, you know, like it's not super complicated. But not not to shoot down youth pastors out there. I got <laughs> nothing but love for you guys. But um, can, maybe you guys can, and, and I'd like to know what you think about this. Sometimes I find in prayer, like when I'm emotionally tired— Prayer becomes like, I don't know how to emotionally engage this, yeah. like sitting down and really trying to receive from the word when, when I, yeah. this is why Netflix becomes so, because I can just turn my brain off. I don't really right. have to think about Netflix <laughs> where when I sit down with the word, I have to actually think about the word. I actually have to process prayer. I actually have to I'm like, but it, it may just be me too. Cause I don't want to have a conversation mm. with my wife either. This sounds horrible, but my personality is not. When I'm emotionally tired, I just want to sit and talk. And I'm going to get so filled up by talking. So I find myself sometimes looking at prayer and going like, I've, or, or even Bible reading. And I'm like, oh, I've, I'm so tired. <laughs> like just emotionally, I don't, that, that feels like more work. Yeah, I think, I think for me, um, when, I'm, when I'm tired, when I'm drained emotionally, I want to pray by myself. I don't want to pray with people. And so the idea of prayer gatherings. You're, and such, other, a good, you're such a good pastor. Well, the, the, uh, no. <laughs> uh, the, the idea of being around people more in prayer because the, the secret place, the secret life just, just fills me. Getting around people, I've got to be on stage again. So I, I'm intrigued by, by the idea of, of a prayer rhythm that helps us as pastors be more emotionally healthy. As, a, as opposed to a prayer culture that takes from us pastors right. <clears throat> in the corporate gatherings. I mean, just, I, I, I'm moved by that. Yeah, I, I'm the same way as all of you uh, regard. I, I think I, it, it's something we have to fight for. It's something that we must prioritize. And sometimes learning how to say no, I, I, I think at the sake of us being I'm convinced I can do more with my 75% of time and energy if I prioritize the 25%. I think the corporate prayer meetings, it's just being there. The the days I don't have energy to read my Bible or anything, I'll just sit there and receive and lightly pray in the Spirit. The pay is the same. There's the days to where I don't want to think, and I'm just sitting there being. And there's the other days where it's awesome. But most of the days are just being there receiving and you don't even really know where you're at when you're there. I, you know, I don't really know. How do you talk about, cause so many, so many guys and girls are task driven. Like they, they, they want, they, they need to feel like they've accomplished something. And, and yet so much, wow. how, how do you, 
How do you integrate that into prayer or even just being okay? Does it feel like you're accomplishing things, not accomplishing things? There's not tasks that we're doing, just sitting and being or sitting with the Lord or how do you, how are you training and equipping people for that regular just being with him, even if it doesn't feel like there's movement on yeah. that? Yeah, I, I think beginning to connect people that God will do more with your 50% of your schedule if you would have waited on him, then he will with your 100% of your schedule, with all of your energy, wisdom, strength, and resources. Mm. It's the understanding of the tithe. We give our, we, de- we declare our tithe and our finances saying, God, you can do n- more with my 90% than I can with my 100. And I think getting people connected to the investment of time, wait, uh, waiting on God and learning how to preach before him and learning how to minister to him and be with him, I believe that's the place where he fills us. I believe that's the place where we get oil. We get the word of God living on the inside of us. That's where we get divine ideas. That's those divine whispers, fascination. He, he, he touches our hearts again with fresh fascination, which delivers us of boredom in our own heart. Because I, I always believe that a, a bored heart is a vulnerable heart. I believe that when you're bored, you're vulnerable. And, and it's really the, the fight over fascination at the heart level. And prayer, proc- wow. it, it, it gets you close to God. And, in, and, in, and many times you don't feel it. Sometimes you do. But you're building a life of prioritizing God. I will wait 55 minutes for a five-minute whisper, beginning to understand the power of that. So it's the one being with him. That's that one aspect. But I, I am real big about training and teaching on intercession, that intercession, Jesus isn't, we, we, everybody loves to talk about the life and death, his ascension, and then his second coming. Nobody talks about the full-time ministry Jesus has been in for the last 2,000 years. And it's the ministry of intercession. And that he rules through intercession. He saves through intercession. He disciples through intercession. And I, and I don't think we understand the power, because this is what it hits. We're, we're speaking words to an wow. invisible God and trusting that these words are translated to spiritual power that are saving, healing, and delivering people that are miles away from us, sometimes across the street, other times across the globe. And we're believing that these words are releasing power to transform lives. So it's a revelation of intercession uh, uh, that I also believe is really important as it relates to prayer and teaching people in that. How do you, do you guys lead in prayer meetings? What would yeah. your advice be for, you know, people that might say, hey, I, I want to start getting something. I'm a pastor. We either have prayer. Well, there's two things we're talking about. Engaging your church in corporate culture of prayer, and right. then you yourself actually <laughs> living a life of prayer. Right. When it comes to the culture corporate prayer, how do you how do you uh, teach people or what do you say to pastors and how to lead actually a prayer meeting that's engaging? Whether it's got whether it's got 50, 500, or sometimes two people show right. up. I mean, I know that, that um, uh, you, who, oh my gosh, I'm, forgive me for this. Is it Justin, re, Justin that just wrote the book on like solitude or something? I John think Mark so. John Comer? No, 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 just a guy from IHOP. Anyways, I'm assuming that much of the prayer times that you led, sometimes there's one or two people in the room. This can be an intimidating thing. I think as pastors, we're like, we want to do this. Let's call prayer gatherings. We're going to call prayer gatherings. But then somehow if we don't get a lot of people there and it's full of energy and it's full of that we don't quite know what to do with me and two other people that decided to show up in this room right now to pray, what's your advice to pastors who are, who if they're calling prayer meetings, two people are showing up or 50 are showing up, but they're mm-hmm. not quite sure how to keep a sustained engagement in a prayer gathering. What's just the practicals around that? Absolutely. Um, I'm used to a lot of those kind of prayer meetings. I, I would say, um, I would say uh, the leaders have to lead. You can't delegate it. It can't be to mama intercessor or this group or that group, leaders have to lead the way and they have to show up. That's number one. Number two, heck, I would do anything I could to get the anointed musicians and band there and say, lead us or get the guitar player, pay him a little bit, do whatever you got to do, smooth him. But just say, I, I think I think worship-led prayer meetings, they lessen the burden of boringness and they actually help 
the reality because pr- singing is praying twice. And I think it's not only just intercessors as we've known it, but it's it's worship leaders and musicians. And that's the other thing with the Tabernacle of David is how he merged together that reality of government with singing and music. And so I think, I think entering in through well-known worship songs, I think coming before the Lord with well-known worship songs, coming together around that, I think having times to where you sing in the spirit with one another, or you sing songs that Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, singing, making melody, learning how to get people lifting their voice, um, having prayer leaders up there, maybe merging a prayer leader to where they pray through a psalm. They direct people to the word. You're praying the Bible. You're praying psalms to where the prayer leader is kind of guiding and being the rudder of a prayer meeting. And there, so I think about we, we, what we do here at Upper Room is called TWI, Thanksgiving Worship Intercession. And we enter in through the door of Thanksgiving. We come into worship. And then we spend the last part of our, our sessions on intercession. And, and I find that the prayer leader kind of guiding that from Thanksgiving into highlighting praying through a psalm and then shifting the room to intercession with focuses. God, we want to pray for a revival in our city. We want you to touch the church of our city. We want you to touch the lost. What, whatever a focus may be, I feel like that galvanizes the room. It can galvanize two and it can galvanize 200. And you use Bible prayers because you don't deal with as much when you've got Susie up there with her latest vision or her latest or her latest prophetic word, because this is what we don't know how to do. It ends Good up turning crazy. into semi-preaching sessions. That's right. <laughs> it turns into prophetic words, preaching sessions, and visions that nobody else understands but that girl or that guy. And it ho- and it hostages the room. It just it removes unity. Wow. It hurts. It hurts the flow of the room, and it makes it a little bit side and a little bit quirky. And I find praying Bible unifies the room. It 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 brings a focus. It brings clarity, and it removes a lot of weirdness that actually helps a prayer meeting keep going on and actually build in momentum and the anointing. Uh, we just had a—I uh, didn't tell you guys about this. We just had like a—in in our city, there was a pastor's gathering of unity where we sat on a stage, and the church, you know, a bunch of different churches came together, and we just talked about different things that were going on. At the end, they said, hey, we're going to take some questions and uh, t- total rookie move. And I'm a positive guy, so I'm like, you know, they're going to ask questions. Nobody filtered them, right? They just said, hey, if you've got a question, get up to the mic. And, and in my head, I'm like, they're going to ask questions. I've been doing this for 25 years. They've never once asked questions, but they're going to ask questions. Sure enough, people get up. They're just full-blown statements. Yeah. They're like five minutes of somebody making a point with no question at all and then sat down. I thought, oh, what a rookie move. <laughs> it happens all the time. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think one of the things that I'm thinking about is there, there's, there's, there's two pieces that—, that I think really matter for us as pastors to, to listen to in the middle of this. I think the first is that actually we, we have to recognize that we, we have normalized a pace of ministry that isn't actually uh, giving, giving of its first fruits to a place of intimacy with the Lord. And I, I do think that there is a, especially again, over the last couple of years where there was a unique burden of production, you, you, you moved online, Every one of us have had disruption, and in that disruption, there's been a lot of challenge. And and I I actually think for the for the ability for us to move forward as whole people centered in the person of Jesus, there has to be a first fruits back in the place of intimacy. And so I do think there is something that has to start in us. And I I think for prayer to be for prayer to be. Uh, what we want it to be, it actually has to be in some ways pioneered by the by the leader themselves. I do think this is part of why prayer yeah. cultures get off is because we hand them off in, in, in a way that they have to be established by ourselves first. But, then, but this is what we do though, right? We we delegate all of our stuff. So, so you know, we delegate the whatever it is, all of it. We delegate, right. we have heads of departments right. that do that stuff. And then we put this in that same category. Yeah. We've got a pastor, we've got a, we've got somebody else that's doing that thing. And at right. some level, what Corey's talking about is this is one thing in the same way that we wouldn't delegate preaching. Right. At least at the beginning, you have to, you have to, I think you have to spearhead what it looks like. And then for me, you know, when Emily and I were, were, were college and youth pastors, and this is, uh, we, when we moved from Seattle to Atlanta, 
in the process of planting the square, there was a season of a lot of like grief because so many of the young people we'd poured into uh, just deeply struggled, walk away from Jesus. I mean, and there was a there was like this pain inside of me of of waste and of 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 how much we had invested in people to have them leave, to have them walk away from the yeah. Lord, to have them walk away from us, and. And I remember this this sense of real conviction in that season of realizing that we had invested heavily, but we had invested in a way that we had taught people how to be okay because we were in their life and not how to be okay because they yeah. knew how to anchor their life in Jesus. Yeah. And for us, there, there became this shift in ministry of saying, whatever we have to do, like I, I do, I, what, you know, I believe we're gonna be at the square for a long time, but like whenever the season of ministry comes to an end, if it, if it, you know, the, the, what I do not want to look back on is go, we wasted so much time teaching people how to be okay because we were in their lives when the actual, the cost of ministry wow. is teaching how people how to be okay because they know how to get to Jesus. Yeah. And for us, where that started was trying to help people get to Jesus by, by foundationally being in the word. And then I think there was this realization several years ago that it has to be the word and the spirit. Yeah. And we have to bring in this place of going, our, our, my greatest burden is that I could, I could leave the square and people will be Still faithful in the connect, person of yeah. Jesus because I've taught them how to be okay because Jesus is in the room, not because I'm in the room. Um, I'm moved by the conversation about the new cart and the shoulders of the priests. And so part of this is, as you're reflecting on this conversation, part of it for me is we have to kill or lay down that fascination with the new cart. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Richard Foster. It says, we don't need more talented stage people. We need deep people. And there's something about the six steps. There's something about um, the, the kingdom of priests, um, people that, that can carry it, um, carry the weight as you called it, Corey. And I think there's a beautiful picture there of, of even if it takes longer, um, a, a culture. And I think, I think lead pastors, I think we've got to carry this first. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what we value as success. It's a value system within us that says, even, even if it doesn't, look like the new sexy trendy cart, which I think 2020 killed a lot of that in the church. People are so <laughs> jaded at what it, what it looked like. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a beautiful thing God's doing right now where there's a new value system that's coming where we're, where we're empowering people to carry that. Hey, and your, your church is smaller now. You've got time to pray. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here's exactly. the moral to every story. Hey guys, listen, your church, you have less people. You have that's time right. to pray now. That's right. Hey, can I, but you're, keep going. No, it's, yeah, it's good. No, you're, you're exactly right though. I, I think that, that that concept that they're talking about of just, I, I love it. The, the six steps and the, the, the walking it out. We have to, uh, it, it's, it's hard sometimes because we delegate this stuff, right? We're, we're like, hey, who's going who's gonna to take on the yeah. charge of prayer? Yeah, that's right. I'm going to hire somebody to do this. That's right. Corey, listen, I know we've been talking about prayer the whole time, but, but we only have a few minutes left. What I'd like to talk about just briefly is, is, is why John says you're the best preacher. And I'm, I'm serious about this. You know, we all have a heart for the actual craft of preaching. We, you know, we want to deliver the word of God in, in a way that's anointed and accurate and, move, you know, really actually moves the heart of people. Uh, you know, Nate's got a preacher school and this is something we have a heart for. But, but honestly, why, can, can you just quickly say, what is it that makes you an anointed and effective preacher? What, what, what is it that you're carrying that you do that somebody could look at and, and learn from? Wow. Um, honestly, I, I, it's because I went to the Bible and I wasn't looking for messages. <laughs> I, I actually began to talk to God in the Bible and I sat long enough for the word to do its work in me and for the word first to judge me and to divide soul from spirit, to break the rock in pieces, to, burn the fire of, burn up the chaff of religion. And, and as he did it to me, I find that when I talk about the things that he has done in me, I follow the same old things, read yourself full, think yourself clear, pray yourself hot, let yourself go. I follow that whole thing when God begins to draw me into a revelation, uh, context and all that kind of different stuff. But I would say it's sitting long enough before the word to let it get on the inside of you. Because I found that the words that will impact others are the words you've let impact you um, yeah. and that you've set long enough before it. And, and so I, it wasn't never about this is what happens. It's 
God, I want you to do this in me. I want, I love your word. Psalm 119 is my life passage. I want I just a love affair with the Bible. And I want every word, every phrase, every kiss. I don't want to lose anything. And, and, and I just have a, a ravenous desire to extract everything from every phrase. And I think the Lord will back up authenticity and saying, okay, I, you know, yes to what you're talking about because you've let it do its work in you. It's interesting with Corey. He was just with us um, for a couple of days and did, he- I just got heavy lifting. Like he moved some things in our environment. And uh, I could tell he was there. And I'm like, dude, this is, he did some heavy lifting for us. And it just really moved some things forward. It was powerful. But it was interesting because Corey is, and I'm, and, and, and Corey, I, I say this in all honesty, like just really like I'm in. I could listen for hours in what you're talking about. There's a depth, there's a, an engagement, there's a stirring, there's a conviction, there's all this stuff as he's preaching. But so drastically different than me. I've got like, 10 dumb stories and two m- mediocre points. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, here's my sermon. 10 dumb stories and then a couple mediocre points I threw in there. And then there's Corey. doesn't tell one funny story at all. Like, he, he at the very beginning, he told a funny story about his mom, but then it's just in. is unpacking five different passages and how they all interweave together to come to this one clear point. And I was just like... <laughs> Oh, it was it was incredible. I, I, I like legitimately. I don't know if people have really had a chance to hear you preach, but it's it's wor- it, it, it's it's worth just sitting down and just hearing both from both from the preaching, the, the what you carry as a preacher, and then also the message. So, Corey, I want to ask you a question. Um, in in twenty twenty, uh, many of us pastors um, did our best to navigate such a strange year, and for for me personally, had lots of friends leaving the church. Uh, more polarization in the church, more animosity, more questions, deconstruction, all this stuff happening. And, and as, a, as a preacher, as one that, that loves the word and, and the sacrament of the word and what God does in the preaching and the worship, um, you know, as pastors, we can get insecure is, is what does what we do matter anymore? I had someone tell me months ago, they said, preaching will be um, no longer relevant to this next generation, which I don't believe. My question for you is, can, can- fascinating. What an arrogant statement. Yeah, I, they actually said, I wouldn't want your job because it's it's like no one will be listening. Like that okay, mode- Okay, maybe it's not arrogant. Maybe it's just well, naive or, or like as if like somehow the church I, will be, I, that's amazing. And, and I don't I don't know any any pastor that hasn't had some of those thoughts of like, you know, the- the, the insecurity of, is what I'm giving my life to actually making a difference? My question for you is why preaching? As you think through today's church and culture, future of the church, why preaching? Yeah, because we're living in a generation that's throwing off the bonds and the cords of God's word, his standards, the, the, the law of the word of God. And we're seeing a generation longing to get, you know, Psalm 2 says, let's break the bonds and the cords. Let's get rid of the ancient. And the power of the preacher is absolutely more now needed than ever to drop the plumb line of the Word of God, to hold the standard of truth, to manifest Jesus and His nature and His heart and His love and His zeal, to re-sign up people, to connect them with Him, it's Romans 10. How shall they hear if there's not a preacher? And how will they believe unless there's a preacher? And we're, we're fighting for faith. We're fighting for the standards of righteousness, for the standards of truth. We're the last line of defense in a society that's seeking to throw off all truth. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I believe it's the last line. It's more now needed than ever before. Well, Corey, listen, uh, we could go a lot longer. We have to wrap up right now. Obviously, we're going to have another, we, we're going to have to have you come on again and yeah. just talk through uh, some of this stuff. But man, so good. Thank you for taking time and just investing in pastors. Uh, just love calling your friend and running with you and uh, looking forward to, how, how can people find you? You also have a whole, I do want to say this, that um, Corey has started a movement. It's actually a part of his story with his son that um, they, they lost, uh, passed away eight years ago. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a deeper story that we, we'll try to get into some other time. But out of that has come a movement called Nashorites, just actually raising up a generation of intercessors in the church. It's actually really powerful. Can you just say where people can come? You've got an online, you, you've got resources, school, you've got so much stuff happening. Where can they find all this stuff if their heart's been stirred by this? CoreyRussell.org. CoreyRussell.org Corey Russell. has everything. CoreyRussell.org. All right. Well, we appreciate you being with us, Corey. Everybody else, man, thanks for jumping yeah. in and, and having this conversation Amazing. with us. We're excited for uh, the rest of Pastors Podcast Season 2. We'll do it again. <laughs>